Good, now I know you're alive. So is everybody feeling pretty energized from last night? Yeah. So I want to thank you, Jacques. Um, I think my brain is on the second last paragraph, so it was really, really a great talk. Thank you so much. So I'm thinking that this is really a great time to be a secular, to be, to be secular, to be a humanist, and to be a Jew. As we will hear many times this weekend, with the influx of a series of books on atheism and non-belief, the so-called new atheists, there is more awareness of the existence of a group of people who share a non-theistic, secular, agnostic, atheist, deistic, agnostic, humanist approach to life. Barack Obama, in his inaugural speech, identified a demographic of non-believers. We are finally being recognized. With the establishment of the Secular Coalition for America, and with Lori Lipman Brown as its first director, non-theists have a group in Washington lobbying on our behalf. With Professor Aronson's book, Living with, Without God, published last fall, and with Rabbi Epstein's book, Good Without God, is that what it's called? Okay, that's what it seemed like the other day. Okay. <laughs> Being released this week. We're so excited, Greg. We're beginning to explore and discover a more positive, secular, humanistic identity. So this is a great time to be secular, to be a humanist, and to be a Jew. This morning, we will hear from two people for whom I have the utmost respect. Two people I am privileged and proud to count as friends. This is like an awkward position here. I first met Lori Lippman Brown at the American Humanist Association event when Sherwin Wine was named the Humanist of the Year. We connected immediately, shared our admiration for Sherwin and our cultural Jewish identity. We continued our association professionally. Lori spoke at a couple of SHJ meetings and she attended a Shabbat service at Congregation Beth Adam in Boca Raton when I was there for a weekend field visit. It's great to have you here with us again, Lori. Yeah. So Ron Aronson's my neighbor. <laughs> we first met through the New Jewish Agenda in the early 80s. He led a study group on the Middle East that I attended. His eldest daughter babysat for my children, and I happily officiated at her marriage ceremony. When Phyllis, his wife, called me shortly after the beginning of the Iraq War, I joined them in organizing our community peace group. Many of you have had the opportunity to hear Ron speak. I happily read a couple of chapters of his book pre-publication, and Ron and Phyllis and I sat around one morning developing the subtitle to his book. This is the third time, Ron, that I've publicly introduced you, and each time I mention the same thing, this very remarkable experience that I have when I'm in his presence. There's something about who he is as a human being and as a teacher that enables me to find my intellectual center. I don't think that this is a unique experience for people in Ron's presence. I think he creates an environment for his students to tap into their full potential. Ron and Lori share some important qualities. They are both passionate about their beliefs. There is a strong connection between beliefs and behavior. You don't have to speak to either of them to know their passions. You just need to observe what they do. And they both have a wonderful ability to articulate a clear message with intelligence and humor. So please join me in extending a warm welcome to Lori Lippman Brown and following her, Ronald Aronson. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm really sorry I couldn't make it last night. I missed something good. Who are secular Americans? Why must we have a voice? On one of my appearances on The O'Reilly Factor, Bill, <laughs> one of the four times, Bill O'Reilly asked me, and to him this was an accusation rather than a question, but posed as a question. And this is the way he said it too. So you're a secular progressive? I responded that yes, I am secular, and I like to think of myself as a progressive person, so I guess that would be a good descriptor. My acceptance of a label that Mr. O'Reilly thought of as a pejorative reminded me of a situation 
less than a decade ago in which one of my high school students, when I was a teacher, who heard me describe myself as a Jew came up to me after class and asked, Mrs. Brown, isn't that an insulting word? He had heard the word Jew in that particular neighborhood. The word was hurled as a derogatory label, much as the way the, way the word gay has been uh, hijacked into a put down in most public schools in the US that I've been to. Who are secular Americans? We are people who do not believe in a God, in any gods, and sometimes we inaccurately believe that we are the only ones who can claim the term secular. But secular Americans also include people who believe in a God, but also strongly believe in the secular form of government that the United States Constitution set up. And secular Americans, especially in the beltway of DC, also include people who don't care whether or not there is a God, but do believe that we must live secular values and protect secular government because whatever individual's beliefs are, a reason-based society will ensure that we are surrounded by a successful civilization filled with compassion. Now some theocrats have a completely erred view of who fits into the secular tent. For example, I did a radio appearance with Alan Combs, who used to be the liberal half of, of Hannity and Combs. And also on the radio show was a representative from an organization representing a Christian nation philosophy. And I was discussing the then recent announcement by the Secular Coalition for America that Representative Pete Stark had agreed to be the first out non-theistic member of Congress. My sparring partner ranted that Congress is filled with atheists. Now, this was a surprise to those of us who've been listening to members of Congress pray to a god in prayer breakfast, invoke God at the end of every political speech, and wave their religion banner at every turn. Holmes pressed my opponent to name even one other atheist in Congress besides Stark. After much hemming and hawing, the answer was finally revealed. Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> <laughs> On the radio, my laughter was audible as well. Um, Combs was flabbergasted as he explained that Speaker Pelosi was perhaps the most religious Catholic he knew. The Secular Coalition for America had certainly chastised Speaker Pelosi for claiming that religion should be the basis for voting for stem cell research. Specifically, she argued on the floor of the House that stem cells were a gift from God and were biblical in nature, and that's why people should vote to allow the research. Pelosi had also erroneously claimed on the floor of the House that all Americans agree that the words under God in our Pledge of Allegiance are beautiful. I personally sat with Speaker Pelosi and explained the reality for families like the Fries in Lawrence, Tech, Kansas. In second grade, Bailey Fry, the daughter, was pushed in the schoolyard and had the sign of the cross drawn on her forehead for not saying under God in the pledge, for being part of an atheist family. The phrase added to the pledge in 1954 is used, as many of you know, in some parts of our country to divide public school children based on religion. Many theocrats have decided that not just secular, but specifically the word atheist means anyone who is liberal politically. And conversely, that conservatives are all theists. When the Secular Coalition for America set up the Secular Values Voter website during the 2008 presidential election, it discovered that even many secularists erroneously think that political outlook as well as political party and theistic outlook are inextricably linked. The Secular Values Voter website was set up to compile information regarding the views of the presidential and vice presidential candidates uh, during that election cycle. And in July of that year, the Secular Values Voter site expressed disagreement with a statement issued by candidate Obama regarding continuing and expanding faith-based initiatives. The Secular Coalition got a number of irate emails from people who couldn't understand why the coalition attacked the person they thought was our preferred candidate. They could not understand that the coalition was nonpartisan and that it would highlight the good and the bad from all the candidates. They would have been especially surprised to meet the many Republicans who support the Secular Coalition for America, and perhaps they would have been shocked to learn that early in the, the presidential campaign, polls showed 17% of atheists and agnostics supporting McCain for president. 
None of this surprised me, though, because at atheist conferences throughout the US, I was hearing from many atheists, some of whom were not Republicans, tell me that they could not in good conscience vote for Obama because he and the Democratic Party in general was pushing religion too hard. I heard this the most following the Democratic National Convention, at which requests from the Secular Coalition for America for Humanists to be included in the opening prayer ceremony were ignored. This was before McCain's vice presidential pick was announced. <laughs> At the time, the polls showed the two major party candidates neck and neck, and even a loss of two to three percent of the voters could have cost Obama the election at that point. I personally believe, and I don't think any other analysts agree with me on this, but I strongly believe that it was the fear of Palin's religious fervor that brought enough non-theists and other secular Americans back to the Obama ticket that helped secure his win, not the Democratic Party's emphasis on religiosity. This was the same election cycle in which Kay Hagan, now Senator Hagan from North Carolina, was attacked for participating in a fundraiser with atheists and accepting donations to her campaign from atheists. The attack ads, ads had been cut to make it sound or appear as though Hagan was saying, there is no God. The line was actually spoken by then president of American atheists, Ellen Johnson. Hagan's response was to air an ad assuring voters that she is a Christian. It would have been so heartening to have heard the issue reframed the way Colin Powell attempted to reframe the argument about whether Obama was Muslim or Christian. Powell had asked, why should it matter even if he were a Muslim? It would have been nice to hear Hagan even ask this question. Why is my opponent denigrating support from patriotic Americans who happen to believe differently than myself and the majority of North Carolinians. Instead, all we heard was that her opponent had lied and Hagen really is a Christian, as though that's the reason you should vote for her. Prior to the formation of the Secular Coalition for America, which was formed by volunteers in 2002 and hired its first paid staff in 2005, there was no voice explicitly asking members of Congress to include non-theists in their speeches and in the process of deciding major policy issues. Today, the Secular Coalition for America is submitting testimony against federal vouchers to religious education, has met with the majority of the Senate and scores of House members on issues ranging from abstinence-only sex education to enforced religious preferences in parts of the US military. Why do we specifically need a voice? Why not continue to only have organizations like Americans United for Separation of Church and State and the Interfaith Alliance, both led by reverends, represent our church-state separation concerns? While they will fight just as hard on issues such as federally funded religious education as we will, their key purpose is not to give a face and a call for respect to non-theistic Americans. And until that respect is the norm, we will continue to see children harassed and ostracized for not having a deity belief. We will continue to see atheist soldiers denied promotions based solely on their lack of a deity belief. And we will continue to be discriminated against in the voting booth. The efficacy and ethics of identity politics has often been debated, but I doubt that any civil rights movement would have been effective without it. Allies played an important role in every instance of identity politics. African Americans were joined by non-black Americans in the black civil rights movement, but I, that movement was necessary. The legal and societal changes that occurred as a result of such a movement would not, I believe, have come about by ignoring race. The lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender civil rights movement includes many allies who identify with society's privileged majority Still, ignoring sexual and gender identities would not, I expect, have improved the problems of marriage inequality, employment discrimination, and hate crimes based on these categories. Thus, non-theists must welcome theistic allies in our struggles. Whether an, ide uh, an individual identifies with the labels we use or simply wants to fight for our rights because they would fight for anyone and everyone's rights, is not particularly relevant to me. I don't go around waving my straight ally flag at marriage equality rallies. 
Perhaps this is why anti-equality counter-demonstrators assume I'm a lesbian and say the funniest things to me, such as, you can get married, just find a man to marry. <laughs> they, they don't know I already found one, but at one rally, <laughs> when I explained that people should be permitted to marry whomever they love, a counter-demonstrator explained to me his own beliefs, which of course he wanted to keep enshrined in civil law. He said, quote, marriage has nothing to do with love, unquote. <laughs> I shook my head, told him I felt bad for his wife, and continued protesting <laughs> with my colleagues. <laughs> Sometimes not mentioning one's ally's status can cause confusion and uncomfortable statements from members of the group. Some of my LGBT colleagues thought I was trying to hide my heterosexuality or lead someone astray by not mentioning it. And I have heard folks at non-theist conferences say some pretty nasty things about religious people in front of someone I knew was religious, but who was there to hear me, and theistically religious, but was there to hear me speak about separation of church and state and fair treatment of non-theists both things that my theist friends can easily get behind and support. Many non-theists have experienced, I understand, grave harm during their lifetimes in the name of religion. Often they come out of these experiences with tremendous anger towards everyone and everything theistic. Their hope and desire, from what I've heard from some of them, is that a lobbying effort for non-theism would attempt to eradicate the silly God notions that others believe, and that a lobby for non-theist interests would by its nature be antagonistic to theistic Americans. Neither I nor the organization I lobbied for felt it appropriate or even wise to take this approach. On a personal level, I have seen so much success working in coalitions, that working with rather than against theists who share our vision of a separation of church and state made perfect sense. There is also the education factor. Many individuals have never even thought about those of us who don't share their deity beliefs. They haven't purposely treated us disrespectfully. In fact, some adults tell me that they have never known anyone who didn't believe in God. It is likely that they have met some people who didn't believe in a God, but none of those they met felt comfortable making that known to them. Like individuals who made anti-Semitic comments to, in front of me not knowing I was Jewish, these folks have probably put down anyone who is unchurched, not realizing that the friend whose ear they had was one of those heathens. <laughs> like learning non-sexist language, there are a number of people who need to be made aware of how they sound when they are speaking theist-centrically and who they are leaving out or denigrating on a day-to-day -day basis. We have had a difficult time ourselves defining who gets to be in our non-theist tent. For a couple of decades, I've been told by Jews and non-Jews alike that I cannot be a non-theistic Jew. I think most people in the audience can relate to this. When the Secular Coalition brought diverse non-theist groups together, I initially heard much griping from humanists I spoke to about the coalition's inclusion of atheists, and much griping from atheists about its inclusion of humanists. And of course, when the Society for Humanistic Judaism joined the Secular Coalition, Many questioned the acceptance of a religion, albeit humanistic, into the mix. The addition of the American Ethical Union brought even more confusion to the discussion. Here was an agnostic group that included some theists in it, but did not require theism as a tenet. I'm pleased to say that today the vast majority of non-theists I meet are glad that the tent appears to be holding everyone comfortably. And while anti-religion voices are an important part of the non-theistic movement, and I recognize that, I think most of us have seen the importance of working respectfully with theistic allies. By meeting the need for an identity politic for secular Americans who define themselves as non-theistic Americans, the Secular Coalition for America did succeed in sensitizing politicians at the highest level to include us. Much as I have been listening for the words gay, lesbian, transgender in political speech for a couple of decades now, I was thrilled this year to have heard President Obama include those with no belief in his inaugural speech, as Miriam had mentioned. I don't think he would have done that if the Secular Coalition had not asked him to include non-theists, and we specifically asked for that in the inauguration. However we may feel about being defined with the term non-believers, Hearing it was exciting because at least we were no longer invisible. We knew they meant us. 
having non-theists find their own voices in the political world, instead of shying away from identifying with this most disparaged of groups, Americans who don't believe in a God, is essential to gaining the respect and safety that every oppressed minority needs. Perhaps the more difficult question for the Secular Coalition for America became what are the interests of non-theist Americans? The Secular Coalition regularly hears from some of its libertarian supporters about its position on funding religious education. Some of these supporters explain that since they do not believe the government should fund any education, they feel that as long pu as public education is funded, private education, in whatever form, must be funded as well. The Secular Coalition does not support public over private education. If a bill ever came before Congress to give vouchers to private, non-religious schools, the Secular Coalition would have no position on that bill and would not lobby for or against it. However, the Secular Coalition will always fight against our money supporting children's theological upbringing. And schools whose websites expressly indicate that every aspect of their educational process is focused on Christianity should not be receiving government funding. I encourage everyone to look at secular.org for the complete testimony that the Secular Coalition for America recently submitted on this issue. Even science issues that the Secular Coalition has lobbied on create some disagreement amongst its supporters. When the Secular Coalition lobbied to lift the limitations that had existed on stem cell research, one atheist woman wrote to me that she opposed anything that would stop potential life on the basis, not of religion, but on the need for survival of our species. Now, I didn't want to debate with her the balance between overpopulation and creating children out of as many leftover embryos as possible. <laughs> this was before the Octomom and all of that. And, <laughs> and while the Secular Coalition acknowledges differences of opinion on abortion and takes no uh, position on that, it has stepped in to fight against limitations on access to birth control which are generally deemed to be the result of theological rules rather than enforcement of any um, maximum procreation for any purported naturalistic reasons. So are we now at a point at which the need for lobbying efforts specifically for non-theists is passed? Are we at a moment in time when the attack on church-state separation has lightened up and the focus of political fights has turned elsewhere? I would answer no to both of these questions. Identity politics needs to continue because we are still a long way from being fully recognized in political speech, in campaigns for elected office, in society in general. The most recent surveys still show the majority of Americans unwilling to vote for an atheist for president, even if that person were a highly qualified member of their own political party. Some states even have laws requiring a belief in God in order to hold elected office. While these laws are clearly unconstitutional, not everyone has the wherewithal to fight a seven-year legal battle to overturn them, as Herb Silverman, the president of the Secular Coalition for America, did in South Carolina. Because of my work as the founding director of the Secular Coalition for America, many people assume that the, if they know about what happened, that the religious attack against me when I ran for re-election to the Nevada State Senate must have been based on my non-theism. Actually, back in 1994, when that campaign was waged, I doubt my political opponents even knew what a humanistic Jew was. They attacked me for not participating in explicitly Christian prayers and focused on the fact that I am a Jew. Adding a lie about my patriotism in order to defeat me in a district heavy with veterans. I spent two and a half years waging a defamation lawsuit to dispute the patriotism lies and won letters admitting the truth from all four of the legislators who had lied about me. But I noticed for the very first time that walking door to door for candidates in the next, very next election cycle in 1996, many people were asking, is he a Christian? Because I only vote for Christians. So even if the goal were not just to get rid of me, but to get voters to focus in general on the specific religious belief of candidates rather than their positions on issues, the tactics used in 1994 had their intended consequences. In October of 2009, the top two issues on the national agenda are not church-state separation. They are health care reform and the war in Afghanistan, I would say, at this moment. 
But secularists, that is, those who support separation of church and state, might be surprised to find that attacks on that separation exist even within these issues. The Secular Coalition for America is currently fighting against three amendments to the health care bill in the Senate. One would require every insurance company to fund spiritual care. Another um, would allow medical practitioners to the right to deny medical care to a patient if the physician or pharmacist has a religious objection to the procedure. And there is also an attempt to restore funding, public funding, to theologically based abstinence only until marriage education. In the military, Non-theists are still fighting for fair treatment and respect, as well as equal opportunities for advancement and perks that have, in some segments of our military, been reserved specifically for born-again Christian soldiers. So whatever the focus of the country, there is still a great need for the voice of secularists and specifically non-theists. We must also be careful not to rest on our laurels, secure in the knowledge that the current administration is better than the previous one on church-state issues. I don't know that anyone could have been as bad as the previous one on church-state issues. There's nothing partisan about that. It was just one particular administration. As we speak, the current administration is supporting the use of a cross on federal land in the Mojave Desert as the only representation of the sacrifice of World War I soldiers. In fact, Buddhists have specifically been turned down when they wanted to add a shrine there. This issue is currently in the US Supreme Court with the administration, the Obama administration, supporting the cross. And a Roman Catholic plaintiff, Frank Bono, claiming that the cross is not a symbol of all war dead, but rather that it is a symbol of Christianity that belongs in churches and homes, not on federal property and that transfer of that small piece of land in the middle of federal property is not the appropriate way to deal with this unconstitutional establishment of religion. If I were to run for office today, I would have to convince theistic voters that, yes, a secular humanist, a humanistic Jew, an atheist even, shares your values. And if you, you the electorate, care about votes that will affect your day-to-day -day lives, you had better stop voting based on who attends the right church and focus on who will vote to uphold your values. And yes, voters, secular Americans do have values. And we're learning that especially through books like the ones written by the gentleman behind me. This is why secular Americans need, and thankfully now have, a voice.